questions. So we can also just wait for people to come in. Um, I mean, I know it looks like I have like a PowerPoint set up, which I do, but it's mostly just a question and answer that I can either go through some of what I have, or if you guys have questions, we can just jump into some of those. Um, so yeah, I guess, uh, does anyone have anything they want to start with or should I just get going? I guess I'll get going. Um, Let's see. Oh, wait, hold on. I got a lot of people in the waiting room. One sec. Yeah. Here we go. I'm going to need to keep on checking that. Letting everyone connect. How's it going, everybody? Let's see, 10. Got 10 people so far. Are you recording? All right, cool. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was just saying a second. Oh, we got a couple more. Maybe I'll wait for some people to funnel in. How are you guys doing today? Yeah. Yes. I'm going to uh, warn you guys. My kids are probably going to come home from school in a second. I might, I might need to shoo them away for a bit. <laughs> All right, here we go. 12. Oh, another one. Oh, is that him? I don't know when to stop you guys. I didn't know you guys all love taxes that much. All right, here we go. Are you guys able to see my screen over here? Yeah, we, we can see that. Like the worst person. Yeah, but that's what one of my friends would say. Can you stop being so awkward? But I was very excited about it, you know. There you go. You can do whatever you want. I just won't eat. You know, if I'm not interested in something, I ain't eating. That's just the way it is. That's the way it is. All right, here we go. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'll let people trickle in here. Um, again, I, I have a PowerPoint put together of a lot of the frequently asked questions that I have. Um, but also, I just want this to be a, an open conversation. So if you guys have any questions, I can pause. It can be unrelated or not. Uh, just ask that people kind of be respectful on waiting turns if people are talking. Um, but yeah, otherwise, let's do this. So uh, my name is Michael. Uh, you guys probably know me as Mio CPA. Um, I grew up in Dallas, Texas, but I currently live in Eugene. Uh, you guys might know, some of you know, uh, this was a conversation not too long ago that I share a name with an infamous uh, child serial killer. I promise that is not me. <laughs> Um, but sometimes that comes up when people are trying to do their due diligence um, and, and figure out who I am if they want me to touch their stuff. So uh, I've been married for 13 years. I have four kids and I uh, like to go snowboarding and camping whenever I have the chance. Hey, uh, Michael, there are these two red lines in the PowerPoint presentation blocking. Anyway, you can yeah, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Let's see if I can get those off. There we go. How's that? That's better, man. Thanks. Hey, thanks for letting me know. Um, just letting people in here try to watch that as we go. Uh, yeah, so professionally, um, you know, uh, I'll go most recent, to most historic. So uh, I've been practicing as an independent CPA, providing remote accounting services. 
a lot of my um, expertise areas, as you might guess, is in the cryptocurrency space, the stock and options trading spaces, helping people with uh, TTS status and 475 elections, um, which is kind of beyond the scope of today, unless you guys want to ask about that later. Um, I formerly worked for the largest West Coast based accounting firm uh, as a tax manager and did similar things while I was there. Uh, it was it's very obvious to me now that the accounting firm that I worked for, I think they're getting better, but uh, the big firms just really aren't ready for crypto. Um, and those who have called their local CPAs, also my experience. Well, there were signs of true damage on there that moved forward up. We ended up having an additional, what was it, $1,500 on Jim's house because it got up under behind the fascia board and actually into the rack. I don't know if that was uh, meant to be a question or not, so I muted him. Um, so yeah, I, I think a lot of CPAs are still trying to catch up. And, and honestly, the IRS is too. There's a lot of uh, unknowns happening. But anyways, I used to work for the big firm. I uh, was kind of tired of dealing with all the politics and corporateness of it all. And, uh, and just really wanted to serve my clients personally. And so that's where I am where I am. Uh, graduated from Brigham Young University. Uh, it's one of the, it's consistently top ranked uh, as the top three taxation programs in the nation, uh, next to UT, Texas, Texas A and M, uh, and I think Illinois is up there too. But um, anyways, that's who I am. Um, and yeah, let's get into the stuff you guys came here for. You don't you guys don't want to hear about me. Uh, so Again, this is a slideshow that I have prepared. People can totally ask questions. Uh, maybe raise your hand if if you there's like the raise your hand button in Zoom. Is that available to people? Um, if that is, that's probably the most efficient way for me to field your questions. So I'm going to start off here and say that there are a lot of unknowns in the crypto space. Um, you know, I am trying to keep up on all the new new things that are happening. Um, CPAs are always doing, you know, continuing education on it. There's a couple, um, there's a lot of things that the IRS hasn't even published guidance for because they're behind everybody else. So as I would say that you guys are the ones on the forefront, you guys are experiencing crypto or, or any sort of blockchain technology on the daily and uh, I experienced it a little bit um, just because I'm interested in the space. Uh, so I'd say CPAs like me are probably next in line. There's other CPAs who just have to deal with it because they have clients that have gains. Uh, and then the IRS is behind everybody else. And then behind the IRS, IRS is the legislation. They, they just don't know what they're doing when they pass laws. Uh, Sorry, I, I am muting people as, as I hear noise. If you do have a question, um, I guess my question is, can people raise their hands? I think there's a raise your hand feature. And it wasn't really serious. I didn't really have surrounded by a bunch of alpha emails. Oh, oh, I see someone raising their hand. Thank you. Rajiv, you got, are you raising your hand to show me that you can raise your hand? Yeah, I was doing, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you do have a question. Let's go ahead and use that. That way I know I can mute you and not being rude when you're asking a question. And if you are asking a question, I know because you're raising your hand. So thank you. Um, all right. So yeah, there's just a lot of unknowns. Uh, there's kind of the order of who knows what's going on. I kind of lay that out. Um, and my job is to help you, the user, um, ex you know, know how to report tax as a professional because I know a lot of the rules that are going around. Uh, and, and sometimes I may ask you to help me better understand what exactly you're doing uh, because there are new technologies being developed all the time. I mean, it wasn't until last year, I think that NFTs really just took off. So, uh, so yeah, the first main question I always get is do I have to pay taxes on my crypto gains? And that answer is yes, you do. And in fact, uh, probably more than you expected to. The, the next question usually ine inevitably is, 
I haven't moved anything back to cash or back to my bank account. So I don't owe taxes. That is wrong. Uh, anytime, um, anytime that you perform any of the following actions, you do have some sort of tax impact. Uh, wow, 44 people here. Wow, thanks for joining. Uh, I'm just always adding new people. That's why I'm a little distracted. So, um, if you come, so let's let's just go through the normal transaction process for a basic crypto transaction. You have U.S. dollars that you're going to buy, let's say, Bitcoin with. That is the, the buy side. Uh, I'm trying to get some people muted here. I don't know. If, if you could mute your line, I don't know who's annoying. There we go. Okay. Um, I figured we would do it during the week. Everybody's making noise. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'll have to do that. So I want to get everything right now. I think it's Rajiv. Could you mute your line? I think I still hear. Okay, so um, if you take a, a, a US dollar and buy Bitcoin, that is not, that is the buy side of your transaction. If you take that Bitcoin, turn it in US dollars, that's when you have a transaction, a, a taxable event. It, but if you go from US dollar to Bitcoin to Ethereum and back to US dollar, you actually have two. The Bitcoin to Ethereum is one. And then the Ethereum to USD is is another. So I think that's where people get tripped up that crypto to crypto is actually, in fact, a, a taxable event that you have to track and report. Um, so yeah, if, if you're only on the buy side, so say, hey, all I did was buy and I've been holding for years, you don't have anything you have to do here. Uh, it's, it's on the sell side or converting to another crypto. Uh, this is another one that people don't really realize why it's important to file something. Um, so there is the statute of limitations, meaning the IRS can only chase you for a certain amount of time. Um, but there are different, different ways that this is applied. So typically, if you're a regular filer and you file correctly, uh, you have three years until after three years after the point of filing. Uh, for the IRS to chase you. So if you file now, you have three years for the IRS to come back and say, no, you're wrong and audit you and change, make audit adjustments. Um, that three years turns into six years if the IRS can prove that you underreported your income or suspects that you underreported your income uh, substantially. So that substantially is typically like 25% underreported. So um, they can say, hey, you know what? I know three years is up but uh, we think you are very bad at reporting your income. And so we're gonna use our six year rule. Um, so that means, yeah. So there's also another one where the statute of limitation never applies. Uh, if they can prove that you were, that, that, that they think that there was a uh, civil or criminal fraud. And that is why now you see on the front page of the 1040, there's the, there's the question that says, and I have it highlighted here, at any time during 2021, did you receive, sell, exchange, or otherwise dispose of any financial interest in a virtual currency? And the reason they put that right there front and center is if you said no, and you knew very well that the answer was yes, and they can prove it, the statute of limitations will never apply to you because they can say you committed fraud because you checked no and you knew that you did and you're trading frequently and you made a whole bunch of money and you did not report it. And uh, that's really the all the IRS really has because they can't track. I mean, they can, but they're having a really hard time tracking all the gains that everybody's been getting on cryptocurrency in the last few years. So they're really doing this so that they can come back later and say, hey, 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 look at this. I'm going to get you for it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the statute of limitations piece. Um, I often get asked about sales. 
Um, if you don't know what a wash sale is, it's basically when you uh, sell a security at a loss and then either 30 days or before or after you that sale, you repurchase the same security. And, and that that is called a wash sale and the loss gets disallowed if you were a uh, a stock or options investor or any other security. The beautiful thing about cryptocurrency and one of the best planning techniques right now is that wash sales currently it's interpreted that they do not apply because they are not securities. Um, they're treated as property in the eyes of the IRS. And people are saying, if you treat it as property, uh, you, um, the wash sale doesn't apply. So you could, artificially create losses by buying and selling at all the major highs and lows and, and re sorry, selling rebuying because you created a taxable event that captured a loss but really you're still invested in that particular um, currency so um, that is actually expected to go away it's a highly um, in terms of tax legislation and cryptocurrency that's probably the highest on my mind that I think uh, legislation is trying to um, close the gap on that loophole, uh, but currently it exists and we don't know if they'll close it retroactively. And if they close it retroactively, what are they going to do for the people who already reported that we don't really know. But today, the rules as they are set allow us to exploit the wash sale rule. Um. So yeah, that's why you care because we can exploit that now. And, and buying, if you have a certain portfolio um, and it took a huge dip like we've seen in the last little while, you can sell and rebuy, capture and report the loss and kick that gain even further down the road. Anybody have any questions so far? I've just like totally downloaded. I'm totally happy to answer any questions. I got one question. Um, yeah, yeah, let's hear it. I so I'm just curious because this is I think in relation to the other slide. Let's say I uh, I buy crypto, right? Um, I buy crypto, but I donate the crypto to somebody else. Flicker. I can tell you that this flicker is probably seventy nine ninety nine. Uh, you wow. donate? Okay. Sorry, you donate the crypto. I donate. The, I donate the crypto to somebody else, and I, I don't crypto receive. I don't receive exchange or anything. Why? I I'm not receiving an income either. What from do I need to do? To hold, hold, on, hold on, one second. I'm going to find that person who's making noise. So if I want to sell for seventy nine ninety nine, I'm dead. <laughs> See, just told him to mute his shit. <laughs> Did I? Uh, I I think I muted the person who's talking though. Now. Yeah, sorry. I was saying that. Um. I was saying I buy the crypto off Coinbase, let's say, right? I'm doing this crypto to um, some person I know across the world, but I don't gain any gains. I don't have to report. Uh, I don't have to report that, do I? That so if, if you buy, if you buy, well, let's be clear. When you say donate, you actually mean just give to like a friend. You're not donating to a charitable organization. No, I'm just, I'm just, yeah, I'm donating to a friend. Like I'm basically giving that crypto yeah. to another person. So what happens in that scenario is if you buy at a hundred dollars and it appreciates to $120 when you gift it, um, you would report the gain on that $20 gain and your friend inherits that basis of 120 and they would pay gains or losses on that. So you do owe it. Now you do bring up a really good question because if you, let's say, instead of giving to a friend, you have a charitable organization that you want to donate to, you don't have to pay tax on that gain and your donation becomes the 120. So that is actually a really great, if you're already a, a charitable giver, that's a great tax planning strategy because you're already going to give anyways. You might as well give away your appreciated asset. But if you gift to a friend, you have to recognize the gain on that appreciation on the date that you gifted it to them. And it's, it's the same if you buy goods and services too. I might as well go into this conversation. Uh, if you bought it at a hundred, sold for a hundred and twenty. Uh, sorry, bought at a hundred and then bought uh, you bought services. Or, or goods at 120, you report the 120 
uh, as your gain uh, when you pay for those services. So what if we're using our Coinbase card to pay bills and then also to po- and taking it out from an ATM with the Coinbase card? Yeah, you're just saying you're you have a Coinbase card and you're paying your bills using that Coinbase card. It's the same thing. Just like I said, when you're paying services at the date you pay those services, you pay tax on the gain that you experienced until you paid the service or the loss, just depending on which way it goes. So that's so every why, time I would draw from the ATM as well, then I'm getting taxed too. If yeah, if it's if it was uh, in cryptocurrency and you withdraw from the ATM cash, that is a sale that you have to report. And then people start to ask like, how the heck am I supposed to ever keep track of all of this? I have thousands of transactions. Um, the best way to do that is through. Uh, there's a lot of good online tax crypto tax calculators where you can link up through API all of your transactions from all of your platforms or wallets, or you can upload via CSV and it will help you keep track of all of those gains and losses. I, I personally use CryptoTaxCalculator.io. I ask all my clients to, to you know, log in and I pay for their account so that we can do all that stuff together. Um, but yeah, you're right. It, it would get crazy. Um, yeah, go ahead, uh, Rajiv. I, you have your hand up. Yeah, uh, so following on from that, I kind of have the same thing. I have a lot of transactions where I don't think I'm going to be able to report. Uh, For example, from my Yoroi um, wallet for Cardano, I know you're supposed to report staking income, for example. I've got many of the DeFi things. And and, and I actually use token tax at the moment, and they don't have um, uh, uh, an API to many of these uh, places. You know, I'm like staking uh, access, say, and Ronin, (laughs) you know, stuff like that. The best way I can think of if, if you can get a listing of all the transactions on that particular platform is to get is to download them and upload via CSV. I know Crypto Tax Calculator does that. Um, I don't know about the other platforms, but, yeah. but you still have to download them all and figure them all out and put them all together. And if you can't do that... <laughs> If it's not just not possible if you can't do that um you know that's a very good question i if if i were working with you i would press you in every way possible uh to get what we can get mm-hmm. uh, at the end of the day um and i have this on a later slide you do everything you can to show you made a good faith effort to report every you know to be upfront about your your crypto transactions And at the end of the day, that is the best that you can do. That is the best we can ask for. Um, The more, the more, the better. Um, But yeah, there really isn't a better answer than that. You just, if you, if we can, I would be documenting every way possible to show that we did every good faith effort so that if you did get audited, we'd say, look, this was what we had. We had nothing else. We couldn't even use calculators, which would be more than any, I mean, most CPAs aren't even doing that. So um that's that's my best advice in that world it kind of sucks you're taking on a little bit of risk but um that's what you do okay thank you i had a i had a real quick follow-on question for that what about nfts though oh, yeah, those yeah, like NFTs. let me yeah let's go um actually austin who posted earlier i just slapped on a whole bunch of stuff here at the end i don't even know why i wasn't even thinking about talking about nfts today until he posted that so this is kind of a hodgepodge slide here uh so nfts let's talk about that if you're an nft creator you know you're you're creating uh trading cards or or maybe you're creating art or whatever it is if you're a creator you are like the artist uh or the manufacturer or whatever it is that becomes ordinary income and it becomes uh subject to self-employment taxes uh, so not only are you getting paid for the ordinary income piece, you get the self-employment piece that comes along with it. Um, if you are a, a purchaser or a trader, uh, or you're, you know, you're, you're buying them in hopes of appreciation, uh, you would treat that like you would collectibles. Um, and collectibles have special rules. Um, you know, if you, if you buy an NFT and it appreciates and you held it for long term, that would be subject to favorable capital gains rates, but not as favorable as a stock or security. Uh, if it were short-term, it would be ordinary 
just like um, any other, uh, like, a, like a short term stock transaction. Um, and it would be the gain. So just like a stock, uh, you bought it for a hundred, it appreciates to 120, you pay gains on the 20 and that will be um, subject to all the capital gain rules. Um, also capital so, losses as well, if you sell it capital loss. losses as well. Now you should remember capital losses are limited to $3,000 a year and it will carry over. So let's say you lost 50 grand on an NFT purchase. Mm -hmm. You can only deduct three thousand dollars. Well, first you would take the fifty thousand and offset any other capital gains you have. And I gave this, I gave my shit to this girl yesterday at the post office. How my shit haven't moved? I, I think you have to mute your line. Yeah. Hey, I was say oh, sorry. Line. That's all right. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, so yeah, if you have a capital loss of 50,000 from an NFT, you can use your other capital gains. You can use it against your capital gains. So let's say you had gains of 40. Well, now you have 10 left. You can only deduct three and you take the seven and you carry it forward to the next year. Um, and you can deduct three the next year and so on until it's gone. Uh, and that's true, not just with NFTs. It's true with cryptocurrency. It would be applied against your if you have any stock or options trading or any other capital gain asset you have, all that gets netted together. Um, yeah, so unrealized gains on NFTs are not taxed until they're sold. That's not true. That's true for everybody, unless you have a 475 election in place, which you would know you would because I would have worked with you on that. And yeah, but typically unrealized gains are not taxed until sold um any other questions on nfts that, that's that's all really all that came to my mind oh support what's up yo what's up can you guys hear me yeah 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 good here um one question i had and i know a lot of people have this is on the three thousand dollar limit every year there's yeah. one way around that and if you wanted to explain that to everyone on how they can apply for that status okay yeah yeah let's talk about that i that's all that's a that's a really fun issue to talk about. So um, there's trader tax status TTS. Um, Four, three, two. Can you mute your line? Thank you. Uh, trader tax status is uh, there's actually two hoops you have to go through to to, to do that. So um, trader tax status is something where you're basically saying I'm a full time trader. I depend on trading. Uh, as my income and, and I may have other jobs, but I can tell you that I trade enough and I spend enough hours and I'm dedicated to this regularly throughout the year uh, that I am a trader. And if I'm a trader, I can be eligible for the next step, which is a 475 election. And um, I would not do this unless you're working with someone who's familiar with this. Not all CPAs know how to structure these. They would have to be very focused, uh, usually on the stock and options, or um, you know any type of trading, uh, day trader type situation. And when you make the 475 election, you are then taxed on all of your unrealized gains. You can deduct. You're no longer limited to the three thousand dollar annual uh, capital gains uh, limitation. Um, you can then take what's called the qualified business income deduction if you have gains it's really kind of a win win on both sides if you're if you have big losses in the year you can deduct all of it uh, against other income if you have it if you have big gains during the year we could structure that to where you get qualified business which is 25% uh, 20% deduction on off your gains right off the bat just because you had gains um that process is um, the TTS election has different rules associated with it uh, that are they're not exactly finite or safe harbor, meaning if you follow one, two and three, you automatically have TTS. It's more of, hey, here's five situations. Tell us why the, you have a strong case for all five of these. And if one of them was weak, you could still pass. Uh, and so it's just, I would work with someone who knows how to deal with TTS. 
475 elections have to be made in advance. There are some caveats to that. I could literally spend a whole hour talking about how to qualify, how to structure things and how to make that happen. Um, and I'd be happy to do that another time. Um, yeah, we, should, we should do that in one of our next sessions. That'd yeah, be awesome. I, like, I like it. And so, uh, yeah, what, what about finance capital gains or like other exchanges not connected to our account that we're taking out through a Bitcoin ATM? Yeah, so uh, I have that on here somewhere. Um, so what about VPN Binance, right? It's not, it's, it's just out there and it's not connected to me. It's not being, um, it's not being reported to IRS. Uh, what do I do about that? And that kind of goes back to the page one. Have you done anything in cryptocurrency? Yes or no. And if you say no, when you know the answer is yes, and they don't know, and you try to skip by, um, then you know, you're, you're supposed to report those, even though they're not being uh, uh, sophisticatedly tracked by the IRS. Um, so, so what I would advise is just to go to one of those calculators and link up all of your different platforms or upload CSV, all of your different transactions uh, and, and combine them all together. But yes, those do have to be reported, even though the IRS isn't good on it, because guess what? the irs that it's it's not about them telling you what they think it is you bear the burden of proof and, and i've seen this in real life so someone came to me and said uh the irs tells me i owe them four hundred thousand dollars i only made ten thousand dollars of income last year uh what's wrong and what the irs did is they went through and they said you sold bitcoin for this amount all throughout the year we don't know what the cost basis is so instead of, uh, let's go back to the 100, 120, bought it for 100, sold it for 120, you'd report 20 in gains, right? The IRS was saying, no, 120. Unless you can tell me what that basis is, you owe me 120. The burden is on you. And so that, that guy that can't even sweat bullets because he doesn't have enough money to pay 400 grand. And uh, so I said, let's work through it. Let's find out your basis and we'll report it. But But the burden, the point is, I know that the IRS doesn't see it, but the problem is, is you bear that burden once they know you, it exists. They don't what even about, have to know it is. What about gambling, like on stake? What Just like if you were to go to a casino standardly, but now that it's online, how does that play an effect? You're talking about gambling in general or? Yeah, well, just with crypto, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you just, so what you have to do is you'll get, uh, let's say you're gambling and you win you have winnings related to gambling, but instead of US dollars, it's crypto. The date you receive that crypto, you have to assign the value in US dollars and that is income to you. Now, gambling in particular, you can only deduct up to the amount you won. So if you have net losses, you can't deduct your loss. You only don't have to report the income. Like if you won 100 and you lost 110, you're zero. If you won 100, lost 90, you report 10. Does that make sense? What if, what if I send it to somebody and they cash me out and they just have it in their exchange? So you sent it to somebody. What do you mean, what do you mean they cashed you out? What if I just know somebody that has that amount of cash and wanted that much in coin? So they're like, here, here's, here's 10 grand cash. They just hand it to me personally, and then I just send it obviously to their address. So the difference then, between it would, so let's say you were, when you gambled, you got 100. And it and by the time you gave it to them, it was 110, or let's say it's still 100. You would say in and out 100, 100, zero, but you would have to show it because of the reason I said, it and my friend with $400 tax bill, you would have to say, I got it in, but I sent it out at the same price, or I got it in and I lost money on it when I gave it to someone. Uh, it, it's still, still, once you receive it, it becomes income. And the difference becomes capital gain transaction that you have to report the gain and loss on. I know all this sucks, you guys. I know. <laughs> Even if that individual and never actually made an account to their bank. So like, let's say they just made these exchanges, never connected to Coinbase or anything, um, but received it on all these addresses, but they always did cash transactions only. Like let's say they had an exchange, they created it, VPN, whole different name. Yep. But somebody gave them like, we'll just send it to me, but they never cashed out. And it's a cycle that kind of kept going, if that makes sense. Yep. I, I see what you're saying. In fact, I have a client who did that a long time ago. They were uh, 
they were gambling and won a whole bunch of Litecoin and now is worth like $400,000. Uh, and they've never really cashed out. They just gained all that money uh, while gambling. And um, the reality is it's the same situation as the v VPN Binance situation. That information is not reported to the IRS. Could you, by happenstance, be able to not report that and never get caught? That's true. But you would, if you did get caught and it was 10, 15 years from now, the statute of limitations will never apply because you never filed a return that was even close to the amount of income you received in that year. They could always come back. Um, and, and I'm not saying they do. 1% of people get audited. So I'm, I know I'm talking big and scary, like you're going to get screwed. The reality is you may not. The, the odds are you may not. But the people who do are scared out of their mind because they can't pay 400 grand when they only made 10 grand. Uh, so, so I'm telling you the rule. The rule is, yes, you do have to report it. Yes, uh, you bear that burden when they find out you had some sort of gambling winnings. Uh, may you be, get by without reporting it? It's possible. In fact, it's it's more likely than not that, that they wouldn't get you. Um, but the reporting requirement as the rules are written and who has the burden to provide that information is all on you. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that does. That's, thank you. That's a good answer for sure. I also wanted to add something here. Um, I, I know Michael can't say this. He's a registered CPA, but a lot of this is really based off, you know, trust of faith on you guys, right? Um, the IRS really can't go into your Binance account and like see what you've done. It's based off the faith that you're going to give the correct information on your return that year. So don't think the IRS is really going to you know, come into your Binance account or your KuCoin account that's offshore and figure out, you know, how much you made or lost. Um, they're not going to do that. But if in the end you, you know, two or three years down the line, have 25,000 extra dollars in your account, you get an audit, they're going to ask you about that. And then you're going to have to explain that, well, this came from some weird KuCoin account. So that's where it comes in. It's a lot of faith based that the IRS is like hoping that you, you know, report what you actually made. I mean, the reality is, is it's that's not just in the crypto space. We have a lot of controls in place for businesses, but at the end of the day, businesses report what they report. It's not always based on generally accounting, uh, generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, but the IRS, if they come in and audit you, they what they this is what they do on an audit. Let's just talk about a business. If you're a business and you over deducted your car and you deducted a lot of personal stuff, they're going to come in and say, give me your transaction detail. And we're going to go through and say, we disallow all these things. And if there's 10 things on that list, they disallow, you have to go through 10 of them and tell them why that should be allowed according to the law. And if you can't do that, then you have to pay the, the adjusted fee. So the same thing would apply in a, in a cryptocurrency. They would say, look, we know you had sales of uh, that would account for $400,000 in tax. You owe us $400,000 unless you can tell us we're wrong. That, that's how it works. And sometimes they say, we don't even know how much it is. So we're just going to throw out a number, make you sweat it until you prove us that that number is wrong. But you have to prove it. That's what sucks. <laughs> so, Michael, I want to yeah. throw something at you real quick. Um, how, how long have you been filing some of your clients tax returns for? Uh, well, I've been in practice since 2013 and I do have some clients from the 13, 14 era. Um, as far as cryptocurrency goes, it's so new. I think my oldest return with cryptocurrency on it is probably in 17. That's when I really yeah. started, you know, thinking about it and brought on clients at the big firm and they followed me after I left because no one else at the big firm was going to do it. Yeah. So, so let's say over the last 10 years, you've been in practice. How many times have you had to deal with your clients actually getting an audit? I have a lot of audit war stories. <laughs> uh, the most recent one, every year, something comes to mind. Uh, um, I have a client that they, it wasn't even my return and this isn't cryptocurrency based, but uh they came to me and said, this prior CPA gave us bad advice on a retirement account that we cashed out and the IRS wants us to pay 50 grand. And then by the way, the IRS told Idaho, so we owe Idaho 25 grand and the IRS didn't budge a, a penny. 
Uh, I was able to negotiate with Idaho using specific Idaho rules um, to get their 25 grand bill down to three. Um, so that's that's a war story there. I have another client um, actually that came from the same CPA in Idaho. Uh, I got a referral from the first one about the second one who said, the CPA screwed me over, this accountant fixed me up. Um, the second one, they were deducting, uh, that they had a whole bunch of stuff, but one of their biggest thing, the reason that the audit got opened was that they deducted a vehicle that they weren't allowed to deduct. And then they came in and they did a whole bunch of stuff. And um, anyways, I, I see it all the time, but I, I do this. This is this is what I do for a living. I see over you know three three hundred uh, tax returns a year. Chances are one or two of those I'm going to get an inquiry or an adjustment that I either have to say yeah you got to pay that or we can fight it. Um, I, I think the statistics say less than one percent of all returns get audited. Particularly, they're particularly interested in high dollars. So if you're you know twenty or thirty thousand dollars or less of total income for the year the odds are smaller that you'll get audited in my opinion um if you're making 100 to 400,000 or more a year uh i think they're higher because it's 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 worth their time to come and chase those big dollars thank you yeah i would we should probably do a session where you talk about some of these war stories because my current cpa literally says he never has to go through audits so i'm always like what what happens right like you are they contacting the the person who filed it the cpa and the cpa has to tell the client you know so i've done a few uh at at the big firm um i, I would say i mean it's not like i have a laundry like i fight the irs all day long so this isn't super impressive but so far, the returns that are mine, I've been able to defend. Um, and not all returns that came to me from another CPA I've been able to defend, uh, but I will when I can, right? You got it. Um, one, one of my most proudest one is I had a client that they uh, bred horses for horse racing on the side. And, and uh, I wanted to come in and say that that was a hobby. And uh, we were able to say, no, they have a legitimate business. They've, they've created this amount of income over time. Um, you know, and that one I was pretty proud of defending because what? truly, I think it kind of was a hobby, True. but I was able to exploit the it came back. wasn't. So. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Uh, Yo, quick uh, question, Mew. Yeah, what's up? I keep uh, seeing these horror stories of like people in 2017 talk about how um, they ended up, they made a bunch of money, they lost a bunch of money, and then they had to, they owed taxes, but they had no money to pay those taxes. Yeah. And my question is just basically how, like, let's say they, you know, made a bunch of money on a coin, made a hundred grand, and they lost that hundred grand on a different coin. Um, like like is that is that the reason that they they owe taxes even though they have no money yeah so that actually is a really good trading question um i wish i would have put it on here myself i see it uh often each year so so i do a lot uh, not only in the crypto space but also for day traders and options traders and it's not unusual um for for you to make, let's say um, you make a hundred grand on, in December and in January you lose 120. Well, your tax year in ended in December of, on the 31st. And so you now have a hundred grand that you have to report on your income, but you already lost all that money and you're not gonna file your taxes until April. Uh, that's just the reality <laughs> of what happens. And so it's important to know that if you have gains, don't go trading those gains that you're gonna have to pay. Don't go trading your tax money. Um, I actually had that happen to a, a he was an options trader. Um, and I don't really ever advise borrowing from the IRS, but he said, look, like I have money now that I'm invested and I think it's gonna come back and I owe a bunch of money to the IRS, I'm gonna wait for it to come back and pay him back. He got lucky, don't do that. <laughs> um, but you're, you are 100% right, that is a total viable scenario. Um, 
if you're truly a, a day trader, I would look into getting trader tax status um, if it's beneficial. Um, I would say if you're making or losing more than 50 grand on either side, tax traders, or you think you have much at risk, uh, trader tax status is, is uh, something I'd, I'd love to talk to you about. It is, it is a little bit self-interested for me to say that because it is a lot more money because we've got a whole bunch of stuff. But if you're plus or minus 50 on each side, I can justify the tax savings on that. So uh, I got you. So uh, basically, it only matters if it, it's it's on the next tax year. Like, let's say I, I you know, make a bunch of money oh, yeah. in July and lose a bunch in August. Yeah. I'm good as long as, you know. Yep. To the end of the year. All right. Appreciate it. Yeah, Thank you. That's true. And, and I do want to point out here, though, that. Um, people generally know how much they've made in crypto, but they don't usually know how much they're going to have to report in game. And that's, sorry, can, uh, okay, good. I think I can, I think I hear myself. Um, so I want to talk about something that we haven't talked about yet. Um, that's super important to the cryptocurrency space. Uh, so crypto taxes, like I said, there's different tools out there. If you were trading stocks and options, the 1099 that you get, unless you told the brokerage otherwise, is a 1099 where- Hey, Michael, reports, we, should, we should probably mute Stoney before we continue here. Okay, is that who's making noise? Yeah, he's, he's echoing. Hello? Yeah, there we go, thank you. Yeah. I have a, okay, so uh, if you get a 1099 from a brokerage for stocks and options trading, uh, that brokerage, unless you told them otherwise, is based on what we call a first in, first out basis. So if you buy this stock, uh, it's probably better for me to just read it because I'm going to fumble my words here. So you buy it, the, the first stock that you bought and you buy that same stock 10 times and then you sell, it's going to take the first one in and you know the first one you bought goes out. So it's going to use this first basis as your cost basis for that transaction. So that's how 1099 works. You can actually work with your uh, brokerage and when you go to sell a particular stock and say, I wanna use this one, not the first one, but most people don't do that. Um, there is an alternative method if we're talking about stocks and options and I'll, I'll tell you how it translates into cryptocurrency. It, it is actually called, uh, in the Internal Revenue co Code, we call it specific identification. And, and it is saying, like, instead of the first one, I want the fifth one. That's going to be my cost basis. And so cryptocurrency traders uh, were exploiting that, really, by saying, using the specific identification method, I'm going to use what we call the highest in, first out. So the highest basis one. So if I have Bitcoin at a basis of, I know these are bad numbers, but I like to talk about it in this way, at 10, 20, and 30 for the purchases, and I sell it for 50, do I want to use the 10 or the 30? Well, I want to use the 30 because that results in the least amount of gain. It's not necessarily the first one. And so when you plug all these into a crypto tech calculator, you want to plug in every transaction from the beginning of time so that it can find the earliest one to minimize your tax bill and further defer your crypto gains. So just because you know what you've made in crypto that year, that isn't necessarily what you end up reporting. And my hope would be is that it's less, right? Because we're gonna use the highest basis. Sorry, I, I feel like I'm talking fast and you guys are probably just like, someone tell this guy to shut up. <laughs> All right, Stephanie, what's up? What about for mining? How do you calculate for mining? Oh, yeah. Mining, I would, I have been treating that as a business. Um, so for example, you bought the equipment to mine, maybe you bought specialized processors, not mining on, you know, most people do that. They find an efficient processor uh, and they mine using that particular equipment. I'd be deducting that equipment. Hopefully that equipment is less than $2,500 so we can, you know, there's special rules there. Um, and the income you get from mining, so the coins that you mine, uh, they are ordinary income as they come in and all that would be subject to self-employment tax and ordinary taxes. That's a good question. Get the, That's probably one of my most frequent uh, beyond just the trading questions, right? 
So the only thing you could write off will be twenty five hundred dollars. No, no, no. Sorry, I probably should have said that. Um, basically, you would be able to deduct your mining equipment if it was less than twenty five hundred dollars per piece of equipment. Uh, it makes it easier to deduct, but in reality, you should be able to deduct probably a hundred percent of it, just depending on your situation. Okay. Yeah. Um, but what? But what? A, sorry. Yeah, but, <clears throat> so, what about be, besides um, the tax? Let's say you you mine every day, right? And um, you take out and then use that to buy other other coins. Then yeah, yeah. that will be separate. Is that right? Yeah, so what I would do in that case, uh, let's say you're mining Doge. I don't know, just making it up here. So you mine Doge and you collect, you know, 10 Doge over the course of the year. <laughs> I know I'm putting out stupid numbers here. Um, when you mine those 10, the day that they come in, they are ordinary income to you at the value of Doge on that date. From that date until you transfer them into something else, pay for services or cash out, that amount is um, is capital gain. So said another way, if it comes in at $100, that $100 is your ordinary income. If it appreciates to 20, 120, then the difference between 100 and 120 is treated as capital gain. Whether it's paid for services, whether you move it to a different coin, whether you cash out, that $20 gets reported as capital gain. The hundred is your ordinary income from your business. Okay, and and how long you owned it, does it matter? Is it um, the longer, uh, hold all the, more than one year, you will be yeah, tax if you If you hold that, that would be under the long-term. So let's talk about that. You bring it in at a hundred. That's a hundred dollars of ordinary income. It appreciates the 120. And it's more favorable tax rate if you hold it for one year or more. Uh, and, and you could be taxed anywhere between zero and 20% instead of anywhere between 10 and uh, like 37%. Good question. I have a question. Uh, I didn't hear a question, so I'm gonna move on unless you do have a question. Uh, I wanna say that a lot, I get this question a lot. Should I set up an LLC for XYZ? Should I set up an LLC for my crypto trading? No, don't ever do that. It, unless you're trying to go for trader tax status in 475 election. There is, that is a caveat. I'm leave, reserving that as a special case. But it actually doesn't do much for you to set it up as an LLC. Uh, because it all gets reported the same way at the end of the day on your return. Um, should you set up an LLC for your business? Maybe. Uh, some people, if it's just going to always be a side gig, you don't really need a tax ID and you're just doing business and no one's ever going to see your social security number and you don't need a tax ID, uh, you can just report that on Schedule C as income. Um, but if your business makes more than, I'm going to say a squishy number here, Fifty to seventy thousand dollars a year. You might want to make it an LLC and make the S corp election because you can save money on taxes there. Um, but it really doesn't become an efficient vehicle for you until you have a certain level of. Uh, some people establish an LLC because they have to give. You know they they want to. They have to give contractors or somebody their. If they don't, they have to get their social security number out, and they don't want to do that. And they want a tax ID, so an LLC is a good vehicle to do that for. Specifically, specifically talking about taxes, an LLC is often overkill in a lot of situations. Um, now, you should talk to an attorney whether an LLC protects your assets. So I'm gonna, Stephanie, do you have a question or is that from last time? Probably from last time. Yo, John, I love the music, but we should probably mute him. <laughs> Thank you. It, it should be highlighting like who's who's talking, but it doesn't always. So I try to mute people. But <laughs> anyways, 
So another one that I got, I think Austin asked this question and I get this a lot uh, from people who are trying to do tax stuff themselves or have, you know, are on Instagram too much, I guess. Um, I want to talk about advertising expenses, vehicle deductions and deductions in general. A lot of people think that just because you buy a vehicle under the name of your business, you can deduct that vehicle. That is probably a really big red flag for an audit. If you have that on your return and you're using that vehicle for personal purposes and, and representing that you're, it's a, for business purposes, uh, the IRS will come and try to reverse that probably first thing. Um, vehicles can only be, de be deducted if you can show that there is legitimate business purpose for that vehicle that is not advertising um, and, and there's actual business mileage on that. So a good use case for a vehicle is an awesome truck for a contractor, right? Like I have a contractor, he, he has a really awesome 2,500 uh, uh, Duramax and he wrote that thing off because he has to use that thing every day in his contracting business. Uh, is the Duramax overkill for him? Maybe, I don't know what he tows, but he could certainly justify it. Now, me as an accountant where mo all of my clients are virtual and I may travel to a lunch appointment for a local client every once in a while, uh, I unfortunately in my new Tundra, I can't deduct. So, um, yeah, that's just how it is. Some people say, well, I bought this truck and I put an advertisement on it, but I drive it around personally. You can deduct the cost of the magnet to put on your truck, but you cannot deduct the truck unless you can justify that you drive that truck for business purposes. Uh, some people say, I bought this truck or I went on this vacation and I posted about it on my company Instagram about how awesome I am and about how awesome my vacation is or if if you do what I'm doing, you can go on vacation. That is the, the vacation expense and the truck or whatever you're posting on Instagram as marketing. Uh, a lot of people will say that that's deductible, but that is uh, ripe for uh, being adjusted under audit. So I- Does the I, same I, apply for rental cars? Well, if you are traveling to a different place, are you saying like if I, if I fly somewhere and I rent a car, can I deduct that as, rental? As a contractor, as a traveling contractor, if you rent cars all the time, does that apply as something you can deduct? Well, yeah, if you if you fly to uh, LA and you're going to LA to perform a job and your main purpose in being in LA is for that job, all the flights, all the rental cars, all the meals, well, 50% of the meals are deductible. Um, and so all of that would be deductible. Now, if I say i mean i i do this so i have continuing education requirements there are continuing educations in hawaii i can book that continuing education course in hawaii at a fancy resort fly to hawaii attend the class go have fun in the evening and maybe stay one day or so uh extra and that can all be a business deduction but if i go to hawaii uh, just because that's what me and my family want to do. And most of my time in Hawaii is for personal purposes, uh, then that is not deductible. You have to show that you had a business reason to be there. And I had to be in Hawaii because I had to learn that specific topic because I'm a cryptocurrency accountant. And there wasn't a better cryptocurrency continuing education course than there was in Hawaii. So sue me. <laughs> right so if you're traveling the whole year and you're renting cars and staying places and that's for your your job uh your business as a contractor that's written you can write that off for the entire year not just for like a week or yeah. a month of yeah renting. yeah deduct all those expenses and if you travel all around the country and you want to go to an nba game uh don't deduct that but you may be able to deduct it if you brought on a if you took a client to the game i mean that there, there's there's some squishy rules in there that um, there's some details in there, but or if you take a client to lunch, well, you can deduct lunch. If you went to lunch alone, you can't, you know. But again, you might say, Michael, how is anyone ever going to find all this stuff out? Well, at the end of the day, you bear the burden of proof. So whatever you feel, whatever you feel comfortable trying, whatever risk 
you're willing to take is up to you. My job is to advise you of those risks and to know that when it comes back, you know, like we did the best that we could, right? All right, we're at four o'clock. Man, that went fast. I could have talked all day. Um, you guys are probably glad I don't. I mean, sometimes we get in those chats like you guys are asking me questions and I'm all hyped about it. And some people are like, please stop talking Texas. <laughs> so appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, I'm always here. Um, you can always summon me with an at. If you guys, uh, you know, have any questions, you can DM me. Um, still have some room for some clients. I would not wait till March. I'll probably close off in March uh, just because I have to promise everybody all their stuff and there's no guarantees unless you're open for an extension. Um, that might still be a possibility in March, but uh and if you don't need me that's fine i'll even tell you sometimes hey look you don't need me you got this uh i'm here to answer a couple questions but there might be a better way for you um but yeah i'm here i'm here does extensions cost more uh no they don't it's just more annoying because you gotta you gotta estimate the tax ahead of time you gotta pay it and then we have to file it and if it's a refund you gotta file for a refund but all that stuff can be done in the summer in the summer so anyways, yeah, that's it. Thanks, guys. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank I appreciate you. it. Really Amazing session. Information. Yeah. Thank you. I hope Thanks. you guys took something from it. Go ahead and talk to you guys. Later, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everybody's logging in. Hey, I got a quick question for you, if, if that's